to talk about specifically the ISSB, which was launched uh, in uh, last November at COP26 in Glasgow uh, as the reporting framework to uh, end all reporting frameworks uh, on a global scale. And here to talk about that are Aisha, uh, Aisha Mastagni from uh, CalSTRS, the California State Teachers Retirement System, and uh, another acronym, thank you very much, and <laughs> Mark Siegel from yet another acronym, EY, formerly, as you know, Ernst & Young. Um, so let's get into this, Aisha, as a sort of a level set. What is ISSB and what is it supposed to do? So thank you for having me. So the ISSB, I think, can really be explained in sort of four focus areas. The first being that it's trying to set a global baseline for sustainability disclosures. Second, it's trying to meet the needs of investors for comparability and consistency. Third, it's gonna allow companies to streamline their reporting, incorporating you know, the financial disclosure, disclosure requirements, IFRS or USS GAAP, with their sustainability disclosures. And last but not least, it's really um, has a building blocks approach where all of those other acronyms and that alphabet soup that we just talked about, it's not trying to recreate the wheel, it's using what's already available. Um, building on the good work of SASB, TCFD, all of those other groups that have really come a long way in creating sustainability disclosures. So um, one of the questions that comes up a lot, Mark, for people who have been in this space is, is and, and by the way, GAAP was the Global uh, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, GAAP, for those of you keeping score at home. Um, the, uh, is, is SASB, this Sustainable Sustainability Accounting Standards Board here in the U.S., what happens to them when, uh, it, through ISSB, has it become in, incorporated? Has it changed anything? Yeah, so thanks again for having me. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to be a SASB board member for the last um, three and a half years, and so, I'm really coming into this with, um, with mixed emotions because it's been so great to be actually at the center of setting standards for an investor audience based on materiality, um, as Andy was talking about earlier from the New York uh, Pension Fund. And, and what happens to the SASB standards now is that they become incorporated as part of the ISSB's intellectual property. And so they have been actually signposted in some of the two in, in the two proposals that the um, ISSB has put out, such that they will be part of an integral part of what is what becomes the ISSB standards. How that all actually fits together is still to be seen. But for, in the proposals for the climate standard um, proposal that the ISSB put out, it actually has the SASB related climate disclosures embedded in it as an appendix for implementation guidance. And for the general ISSB standard, it actually says companies should disclose all material ESG information, and again says consider using all the SASB information based on your industry to help you meet that requirement. Right. And another one, Aisha, is the, another four-letter acronym, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, TCFD. Uh, what happens with that? I think it's very, it's very similar to, to what um, Mark was saying about SASB. Um, the TCFD is really incorporated into the ISSB's model, and it builds on that framework of you know, governance, strategy, risk management, and setting metrics and targets. And so I think that's really key because you know, at CalSTRS, we've been long supporters of that because as investors, we need that comparability and we need that consistency because um, we're a universal investor. Yeah, well, uh, and there's one, one more uh, acronymic uh, organization that it simply cannot be uh, left out of this is the SEC, uh, which of course has its own uh, uh, climate disclosure proposal that we don't really know where that's gonna land, but the comments are closed and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people for it and a lot of people against that. But uh, just assuming that some version of that 
ends up being reality, what happens to, how does ISSB relate to the SEC's disclosure uh, proposed requirements? You know, well, we're really hopeful that, uh, that the SEC's final rule incorporates ISSB as, as a standard that companies can use in regards to their sustainability disclosures. Once again, you know, the SEC, we don't want them to recreate something that's already, you know, so many good people have already done so much work on. But we want the, the, the final rule to have some sort of reference that that's what companies can use in terms of their disclosure. Keep so mind, okay, yeah. uh, just keep in mind that the SEC's proposal is on climate and the remit for the ISSB will be much broader than climate, right? And so, um, you know, that's something that it's important to keep in mind. The SEC's proposal is has many similarities to what the ISSB proposed as relates to climate. It does have some nuanced differences, though, as well. Well, I want to talk about two, the two key audiences uh, that uh, this is supposed to affect. One is institution, the institutional investors, and the other, the companies, the reporters, the corporate reporters. Um, so, Mark, does this address, let's start with the investor side, does this address what uh, they're concerned about? And, and, you know, given what we heard before about uh, all the, the ESG ratings and scores that, that are out there from all these organizations that is itself an alphabet soup and kind of a maybe arguably a mess, does this start to make some sense of it? Well, let's keep in mind... Um that the goal is a, is a pretty big aspirational goal, is to meet the informational needs of investors on non-financial reporting. That's a pretty darn big aspirational goal. Right. The financial markets and, and the Financial Accounting Standards Board and the SEC have had 90 years of maturation to meet that goal. Yeah. And, and now we're trying to squash that and compress that into 90 months and in some cases 90 days. So this is gonna be a bumpy ride. Yeah. Um, what the investors generally in my experience have been looking for over the last number of years has been for companies to report under SASB and TCFD. Uh, that's kind of been the consensus what the, what the investor audience has been asking for. Um, it's not to say that GRI is unimportant. It's, it's very important, but for a wider audience, the, S, the SASB and the TCFD have been really focused in on the investor audience specifically. And so I think to the extent that the ISSB is able to continue to incorporate the things that made the TCFD and the SASB most useful for that audience, then I think they've got a good chance at setting that foundational building block um, to be a starting point to have some of those conversations that investors want to have with companies. Yeah, well, Aisha, you're, you're an investor. First of all, give a little bit of a, a thumbnail about uh, CalSTRS in terms of the size of the portfolio and, and, and how you're okay. thinking about it. Well, really quickly, the, the, I want you all to imagine your favorite teacher from growing up. And what we try to do is just provide them a safe and secure retirement because teachers in California don't actually get, they don't pay into Social Security, so they don't get Social Security. So, but we are the $300 billion pension fund for the teachers of California. Um, back to what um, Mark was saying about what, what investors are looking for. Look, we know that the SEC rule isn't going to solve climate change. And we also know that our portfolio We've made a commitment to get our portfolio to net zero by 2050 or sooner. That's not going to solve climate change. But we're all trying to do our part. And we're going through the process now of trying to measure the emissions of our portfolio right now. And, you know, less than 60 percent of the companies in a portfolio actually just disclose scope one and scope two. So how can you reduce your emissions if you don't even know where you're starting from. And so that's why we've been, you know, broad supporters of having some type of mandate from the SEC, because I think this is the information that um, investors really need. And does the ISSB uh, standard uh, incorporate scope three, the supply chain uh, emissions or, or other impacts? Well, we're pushing really hard. Um, I think that's we've already submitted our comment letter. Uh, when it comes to scope three, the current rule under the SEC is really asking for companies to disclose scope three where it is material risk to their business. You know, for, for us, because we're a universal owner, we want that consistency. We want it from all companies. We know scope three is not perfect. It's not perfect by any means, but we also think that companies have access to the best data. <coughs> 
This is one of the, the areas of the proposals that's different from the ISSB. The SEC, um, as Aisha said, it says only disclose it in certain respects um, or when it's material or you have it as part of your um, plan and target already. The ISSB actually has, requires it, requires a, a scope one, two, and three if material. Um, overall. And so, so this is an area where the ISSB proposal goes a little bit further than what the SEC says. And are they, is that going to get harmonized at some point, or how does that work? Well, the good news is that all the proposals from the SEC and, and the ISSB and even the EU, the European Union, are all out at the same time. So you can compare and contrast and comment on them together. The bad news is, oh my God, they're all out at the exact same time, <laughs> and there's thousands of pages to, to read and try to get through. Um, so. The hope is that they will try in large part to converge and work off each other, or at least where they overlap, they will try to align, um, knowing that they, they potentially have slightly different objectives, at least with respect to what the EU is trying to do. So if you're a, a corporate reporter who has to put this information out to Calsters or any of, you know, dozens, scores, hundreds of other investors, how should you be thinking about this uh, and it, it, at what point are some of these changes going to happen? Should I be thinking about this for calendar 22 or 23? Just help us think about this. Yeah, so many, many corporate reporters have already, as you know, been voluntarily providing some information outside of the financial statements. And what's happening now is, is because of all the regulatory um, overhang and uncertainty around it, the controllership functions at companies are starting to finally lean in. And so what's happening there is you're getting more robust controls, more robust processes, more attention from the CFO and the audit committee. That's all good news. It's not necessarily, that in and of itself doesn't necessarily lead to more information, but it leads to higher quality, more robust um, investor grade information that's on par with some of the financial information. So that's helpful. Um, we're also seeing companies trying to, to lean in and, and do, you know, really hone in on their materiality assessments because ultimately what matters most, at least I think to the companies and hopefully to investors, is that intersection, that nexus between business model and, um, and ESG. That's where you should be spending your time if you're a company and, and you shouldn't be spending your time trying to you know, boil the ocean with all the different ESG issues yeah. out there. Uh, Aisha, what are you hoping to see from the companies in which you, uh, you invest? So look, we always say we're the ultimate long-term investor. Um, teachers as a profession live longer than others. And if you're a teacher in California, you live even longer. And so, you know, we're not being a very good fiduciary if we're not managing uh, these long-term risks. And so we just want companies, we want companies that are around today to be around 20, 30 years from now. And so um, you have to be, you know, looking at these things that are material to your business and that can be disruptive to your business. And you have to be appropriately managing them. So let's talk, uh, sort of get to that, how do we prepare for this? And when we th you know, talk about this at, at Greenfin 23 and 24, so a year out and two, two years, what, what's the conversation going to be? Uh, how is this going to be moved forward, uh, Mark? Yeah, so the way I sort of see this happening is you will continue to get a little bit more regulatory um, you'll get a little more regulatory action that's finalizing some of these proposals that are out there now. Now, what I think is, is kind of interesting is that Alphabet Soup that we've been talking about, the voluntary frameworks that are out there, those are converging. Those are actually getting caught up in the ISSB for, to a large extent. But what's happening now is that the regulators around the world are all weighing in, and they're all weighing in a little bit differently. So as we get convergence of the voluntary frameworks, we're still at risk for regulatory fragmentation. And you have different requirements depending on where you reside. And that's, so, so I think that's gonna be the bumpy ride over the next couple of years that we're gonna see. Yeah, Aisha? No, I would just add that that's, you know, part of our comments to the SEC is allowing some flexibility for various jurisdictions. Um, you know, the differences between IFRS, IFRS and USS GAP and US, US GAP. Um, and so I just think that it's really important that um, I totally agree that it could be a little bit of a bumpy ride. A bumpy ride with sustainability is shocking. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so I want, I want to end with the question that this session uh, purports to ask, which is, is 
uh, ISSB going to really transform the things that uh, it's setting out to do? Ayesha? I would just say that I think that the focus areas for the ISSB, like I said at the beginning, it's establishing that baseline of sustainability disclosures, meeting investor needs, allowing companies to provide comprehensive disclosures, and building on all the good work that's already been out there, I think it's off to a really, really good start. And so I'm really hopeful that it's going to, um, you know, solve a lot of the issues that we're all struggling with as market participants. Mark, are you uh, as hopeful as Aisha? I'm very hopeful. I'm optimistic that they will um, do a good job of really trying to meet that investor need uh, and, and, and actually get some more comparability in terms of what ends up being um, out there in the rest of the world, too. I do think, though, I don't see why this is going to end up different from financial reporting in that you're going to have a set of requirements like you have U.S. GAAP, and then companies say, well, that doesn't always help tell my story. And so they issue non-GAAP. I think you're going to end up with the same thing in ESG reporting. So you're going to end up with mandatory ESG rating reporting, and then you're likely to have a company say, yeah, but that doesn't tell my unique story, and you're going to have voluntary ESG reporting still coming. So my guess is when, this, when the dust settles toward the end of the decade, you're probably going to have four languages out there, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Remember our first panel said reducing things to ordinal numbers and, and one dimension doesn't really help. Having multiple dimensions, you know, investing is a mosaic and having the, all the different pieces of the tiles can actually help you build the picture. So I think and, that's okay. No, and I think that's a really good point because remember when I was talking about the ISSB at the beginning, it's a global baseline. That means that's the very minimum. It's the same thing with the SEC. The SEC gives minimum disclosures that are required. That doesn't mean that companies can't expand on that to tell their story better. Yeah. Well, stay tuned for all of this. This is, as we say in the news business, an evolving story, a developing story, and it's going to continue for quite some time. Please join me in thanking our panel.